There are only two ways to get to Hartley Bay. One is by float plane, the other by boat. There are no cars and no roads. Hartley Bay sits in the center of the Great Bear Rainforest, the only intact forest of its kind left on the planet. Yet what happens in this remote village of just 200 people nestled on the coast of British Columbia may have more impact on the rest of us than we could ever imagine. Hartley Bay is home to the Gitgat, one of the First Nations people who have lived here in the Great Bear Rainforest in harmony with their surroundings for thousands of years. Now, the survival of this distant region hangs in the balance. But if they succeed, it could offer all of us as powerful a template of how we can operate in the world as any place on Earth. Still, it may be difficult to imagine that the efforts to save this distant place of such beauty and serenity would become known as the War in the Woods. We've been having this war in the woods in British Columbia since the middle 1980s and have pitted loggers against environmentalists. Lots of tension, lots of anger. The loggers are looking at it going, how do we do this economically so we can stay in business? It's 21 million acres or an area roughly the size of Switzerland. This is one quarter of the world's remaining temperate rainforest. In my own travels to visit rainforests in Brazil and Indonesia, I've seen the cost of their destruction to local communities. Cutting trees to produce cash crops is responsible for 17% of the world's carbon emissions. More than is produced by all of our cars, trucks, and planes put together. The Great Bear Rainforest alone stores the same amount of CO2 that 28 million cars produce as they travel the world's roads. For more than 150 years, logging was the center of economic life along the coast of British Columbia, seen as one of the most dangerous and heroic professions in the world. The Howe Sound pulp and paper plant, just outside Vancouver, is one of the biggest of its kind in the world. Wood from the Great Bear Rainforest arrives here every day Mac Palmieri is the CEO. The old attitude was just cut the trees down, there's lots of them, and we want the product. But the cost of cutting old growth rainforest had gone beyond the returns to be made from the sale of wood and paper. All of a sudden, there's people coming out of the forest wearing white coveralls. Well, the coveralls say Greenpeace on them. Patrick Armstrong works for the logging industry. There were three or four Greenpeace activists that were chained to the equipment. We put a tree that they had chopped down, a small one, and we wedged it under a logging bridge, kind of shimmied out, just kind of tied myself on. Now, nobody could move it because below her was maybe 100 feet onto the rocks. That blocked the bridge. The police came. They couldn't do anything about it because there was no safe way to get her off there. Even though it was nutty, she also appeared a little bit courageous because it was pretty dangerous what she was doing. The protests were led by a coalition of environmental groups. Yeah, I was just a revolutionary. I wanted radical, immediate change. And I was willing to go to lengths to get there. And that happened year after year, and the change didn't happen. Then I started thinking, what would they care about? That's when we shifted to the marketplace. When the environmental campaigners went to the marketplace, they weren't talking about the loggers and people in forest-dependent communities. They were talking about the big corporations. Companies like Home Depot and Lowe's and the German pulp and paper industry, they didn't want to be part of buying the last remaining temperate rainforest on the planet. Meryn Smith has dedicated many years to her work in the Great Bear. We were working in the marketplace and getting consumers of the wood and the paper to understand that they were buying the last remaining temperate rainforest on the planet. Some canceled their contracts, but some said, we want to buy your product, but we want to buy a sustainable product. Most of the companies we talk with have no idea where their paper comes from or where their wood comes from. They don't know the choices they're making. Part of this is getting them up to speed on what the choices mean, and then a lot of times they're willing to make different choices. A junket had been organized by the logging industry. These are guys who bought about a billion dollars worth of, of paper a year. We flew them over, we talked about 
forest practices. They saw clear cuts and we ended up in an organized meeting with the chief forester, the deputy minister of forests, about three of the major logging companies and a bunch of the environmental groups. The papermakers, the German papermakers and publishers took us all to the woodshed and said, we want to do business in British Columbia, uh, but we don't want to, uh, we don't want to do business in the middle of conflict. There were too many people not talking to each other, so in, in a confrontational mood, uh, and we absolutely needed to change that because we have business interests. We want to use uh, the best raw material and product there is in our magazine paper, and uh, pulp from British Columbia is of excellent quality. Florian Niem is the corporate sustainability officer for the German media company Axel Springer. He is largely credited with bringing business and the environmental groups to the negotiating table in the Great Bear. And he had a clear message for the environmental groups as well. You need to come down uh, off the trees and sit at the table and talk, not to us, don't lobby us, lobby your stakeholders in your society, in the region where the decisions are taken about the way of using uh, the forest resource. All of a sudden it went from the steps of the legislature to the stage of the world. For a British Columbian, people could understand the need to log forests but maybe for customers, they couldn't quite understand why you'd cut down a 500-year-old tree to make a forest product. The other powerful message was coming from the people who had lived in the Great Bear Rainforest for millennia, the First Nations people of the British Columbia coast. Art Sterritt is a leader of Canada's coastal First Nations. He's also a noted artist whose work includes these totem poles in Hartley Bay. We're talking 25% of the coastal temperate rainforest left on planet Earth. It's here, we know how to sustain it, and it knows how to sustain us. We just need to kind of blend in there and make sure that we do it in a proper way. And those are the lessons that we have always been taught by our ancestors. That we never exceed the limits of nature. That we never take what we don't need. One of the most Respected elders is Helen Clifton, whose husband Johnny was the Gitgat chief. For one month each spring, she leads the seaweed camp where the seaweed is collected just as the Gitgat people have been doing for thousands of years. I've told some of our people, enjoy it while you can because the outside world is moving in on us so fast. This is a way of life that has always been here. And people were able to live that kind of a life and be healthy. We are caretakers of the land. That was given to us by the creators. All indigenous people are to be caretakers of the land, wherever their land is. After years of protests and negotiation, an historic and groundbreaking agreement was reached. The deal, which had the political and financial support of the Canadian government, as well as private donors and foundations, was to set aside five million acres, an area the size of Ireland. Clear-cutting has come to an end. The First Nations will now oversee sustainable logging, and millions of acres of old-growth trees will be protected. What has happened in the Great Bear Rainforest is unique. We went from just that fight uh, between environmental groups and logging companies to something much bigger and much better and tried to work out a solution going forward that uh, could be a model for the rest of the world, and, and we've done that. During the G20 summit in London in April 2009, I was able to convene a meeting of world leaders. This led to the Paris-Oslo Partnership Agreement. It will mobilize over $5 billion to help rainforest countries protect their forests. We need to take the lessons that are vested in this land and learn to live in harmony with our environment. That's what's going on on the Great Bear. My father was a logger, so I've been in the forest industry associated with all my life. 
If we manage our business right, all stakeholders benefit. So we're not taking it all at once and we're leaving it for the future generations. It can be here a hundred years from now. People need hope. If we can't actually create new models that scale up, then there's no reason to hope. We have a world that needs changing, not just the Great Bear Rainforest. We need to step out of our comfort bounds, work with people we never thought we would work with. It takes, a, I think, a tremendous amount of respect. I, I want it back if I'm gonna participate in the process, but I have to give it. This actually is the work in the world that I need to do.